Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. And with that, we are back for another episode of The Intellectual Podcast, now coming at you as a show on our YouTube channel as well with video. Um, so this is actually our first like official video podcast. So welcome. Um, we are in our ninth season of the show. If you are just joining us, thank you for joining us. There is over 300 hours of content available at The Intellectual Podcast, which you can find on all the podcast players uh, that you could possibly use. I mean, we've been at it for a long time. So I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, we have two guests today. Uh, one is a friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, who I actually met through San Diego WhoCon, although we had been Facebook friends for a while before that. Being San Diego-based creatives, uh, we have a tendency to to meet each other online before we meet each other in person. So I'm going to bring him up. Here he is, uh, voice actor uh, extraordinaire and soon to be seen uh, with his face, not just here, but uh, hopefully in other projects to come. Mr. Mark Biaggi. Hello. Hey. Hey, everybody. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Really excited to be here today and uh, chatting with you again. Yeah. We Speaking of San Diego Hukon, we got another one of those coming up here in just a few weeks, right? Yeah, Yeah, we do. It's the uh, weekend of the, was it 20th, 21st? I can't remember. Let me bring up my calendar. Is that Isn't next that to last me? weekend of October, I believe? Yeah, next to last weekend of October. There you go. 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. There so, it is, yeah. Um, and we will both be there. Yeah, in it's person. at the hand, at the Handlery, I believe, this time. So we're returning to Mission Valley at that hotel. Um, yeah, that's where, be a lot that of where fun. I went and did my first one was the handle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's where we met, where we met in person, like you said, and got to be even better friends and stuff. I had a really <laughs> good time. So uh, that's great. So, um, so you're on the podcast uh, today because I reached out to you and said, hey, uh, I took a hiatus on the podcast uh, at the close of pandemic. I just I'd been overwhelmed and yeah. I started a new job and it was just getting to be a lot. But I'm ready to get back at it. And I was like. I know Mark has done Hukon with me, but I don't believe we actually ever got you on the actual podcast. I don't think in the so. Past. Um, I don't think you did. I, we talked about yeah, it, but we never we made did. it happen. So I was yeah. determined to get you on. And unfortunately, the schedule worked out where Whitney couldn't join us today because she's coming oh, back from some no. actor conference in Arizona. I oh, know. So she's big. given she's given me a ride on Wednesday night to a premiere of a film that I'm in. So, <laughs> well, there you um, go. I'll see her then. So um, sorry we missed you today, Whitney. You but, guys can um, have a virtual podcast of your own at that point. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a fun little film. I'll, we'll talk about that another time. But uh, yeah, when you well, approached me, it was like I had a you know I have a project that I'm very much involved in right now. Um, that is doing one of my first big thrusts into the audiobook world. Even though I've been a voice actor for many years, I've done a lot of other recording, um, a lot of video game animation, a lot of educational software, you know, pretty much everything across the board. And storytelling has always been something I've loved. I'm a big science fiction fan and, and fantasy and all sorts of different uh, genre-related stuff. So um, started thinking about putting my feet in and and figuring out audiobook stuff. And I happened to uh, meet Mason Thomas, who's a really great author who uh, had a project he was looking to uh, get voice work for. And uh, and it's it was like it just uh, so many things coming together really well at once. And I'm really excited to be working on it. Uh, Mason's a great guy. You'll, we're going to meet him today. Um, he's here. And we thought that we'd uh, we bring uh, him on? talk about the project. Yeah, let's bring him in. All right, Mason, here you go. There he is. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, Mason. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having <laughs> He's me. He's joining, joining us from Chicago today, where he where yep. he lives. So, oh, yeah. um, but, but we actually met at Comic-Con, yeah. of all things. It was just the so, weirdest random serendipity, uh, how it just all came together and uh, like connected instantly as soon as we met. He, he was at the bar and I was at the bar and we happened to just sit down next to each other and we're having a drink and just started talking yeah. and like oh, one see, thing now after another. One thing like led to another and he's... the fact that I don't drink. <laughs> yeah, well, 
you don't have to drink booze to sit at a bar, you know. There's, that is correct. It's a little weird. You know, sometimes. you could. It can be. It can be. But I think I was eating some some of their chips too, or something. You were. I had. To, right. I was getting a little nosh between uh, between things to do and relaxing and stuff. And and Mason was sitting there, and I was just like, you know me, I'm friendly me. I just. I like talking to people and getting to know people. And I've met so many great people um, at uh, at Comic-Con in different places. In, in fact, at that bar. Um, and some of them, and many of them have, are still friends. And, and some of them I have professional relationships with now, like Mason. So uh, mm -hmm. he was talking about his book um, and uh, The Shadow Mark, which is the cover work is behind me right now. Um, and, uh, he was, and I said, well, do you do audio adaptations? And, and he said he was interested in trying to get something like that. So, uh, we touched bases after Comic-Con and one thing led to another. And here we are, uh, actually getting this Kickstarter going, uh, officially launching on October 1st, uh, is the plan. And, uh, and it's, and we're really excited. Uh, I, I love the book. It's great. I think you're all going to love the book. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, Mason. Uh, yeah. We've heard Mark's, uh, you know, fairy tale story on how that first meeting went. How it go <laughs> on from your end? <laughs> um, it, is, it is. It is true to uh, to every word he said. Uh, I uh, like both of us were <laughs> very friendly and like to talk to people. So we just started uh, chatting each other up and uh, just one common element after another about how much uh, like how much we love genre and how much. Uh, um uh we love audiobooks and and fantasy and uh we just uh I, I told him that I'm a I write gay speculative fiction and his eyes lit up and uh and we just went from there and uh it's it's been an incredible partnership um I I, I can't shout it loud enough how just every day I'm so impressed by Mark and his work and his work ethic and um, it's like he reaches into my brain and pulls out exactly what I intended for that character. And I don't know how he does it, but He's it's kind of astounding. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, he would send me these video clips and say, well, this is kind of where I thought this character was going and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God, it's exactly how I wanted them to sound. And it was just, uh, it's, it's spooky in a lot of ways, how he is so right on point oh, wow. on everything that i wanted to accomplish with with this story uh and like just minor things here or there but otherwise like just 99 percent of them is like knocks it out of the park the first try it's it's really wow. astounding yeah so it, it the, really that, thanks for time, Mason, that you is this the first time that you've heard somebody orally interpret your writing so I had um, my my first book um, did get an audio version, um, and yeah, so it was it's a it's a strange story for that one too. But um, so that was done through the publisher that I was with at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, the narrator there is Joel Leslie, who is also an incredibly uh, well established, uh, and I was incredibly lucky to have him uh, for my first book out of the gate to get Joel Leslie to read it. I was very lucky. Uh, but then since I left the publisher, I didn't get the other books made yet. So it's always been on the back burner of something I wanted to get done. And it, I love the process uh, of hearing it go to audio. Uh, it's fascinating to hear how people interpret your work and to hear it back in in tone and inflection and emotion and all of, like things that are in my head uh uh coming to life uh, is is just is really uh just such a glorious experience and and going back to mark and just how easy it is has been to work with them for this project i just can't wait to hear the end result now i know i love audiobooks um but i know they're not always done the same sometimes they're mm -hmm. straightforward readings yeah and sometimes they're performative um and knowing mark i can only imagine that there are a number of voices associated with characters so you're actually characterizing <laughs> uh, performance right mark oh yeah you bet uh i am a multi i would expect nothing talent. less of you <laughs> I'm a character. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't, I can't not do it. It's just part of who I am and, and, uh, what I've always done in my voice work. Um, usually getting a lot more voices for voices that I do rather than my own voice, but this is kind of like a combination, um, of that. So, um, and, uh, yes, I am, I am performing 
this work. It's it's narration, but there's all the characters are acted out in their dialogues. Um, we haven't really changed it. It's it's exactly the text as Mason wrote it. So, um, but yes, I'm bring, bringing character and performance, different voices in, probably more than you hear in a lot of different audiobooks out there. Mm -hmm. um, there are some, I know there are people who do it, um, but these are not, uh, some of these are, are very different characters and, uh, and some real strong voice work here. So it's been exciting and fun for me as a voice actor to be able to embody these characters and, and analyze it. And one of the great things about Mason's writing is that it really, the, his descriptions of the characters and their dialogue really lent themselves to certain types of uh, voices that I used and ideas and and uh, that's why it was so easy for me to really kind of I pin down what I see this character as uh, when I'm reading it and, and hearing it in my mind, uh, hearing it inside your brain before you start speaking it. Um, and of course, you know, when you're reading it, you, you play around with it a bit, uh, you know, just on your own, just to see, you know, when you're reading it out loud, what it's like. And uh, found some great voices uh, for the characters that really worked for me and fit for me. And I'm so glad they worked for Mason as well. It, it's incredible. And one of the things that I never even considered when we were talking, uh, we had a long Zoom meeting uh, about a week ago, right? Yeah. Uh, and he would like making sure that all the people that are in the room have sound like they're supposed to sound but at the same time are distinctive enough to where mm -hmm. you can tell when one person's talking even if it doesn't have a dialogue tag so his mindfulness of being able to puzzle that together i was just so blown away by it and he like pieced together that like so this character is going to sound like this so it doesn't sound like this but they you know it's it, it was just blew me away it's just well yeah. that's where mark's mark's voiceover uh background i'm sure comes in really right. handy because mark right. you i'm sure you've done it yeah, most voice actors have had to do it where they've <clears> acted <throat> opposite themselves multiple yeah. times on various yes, projects. I have, and, they, and five characters, right? You have to be very, yeah, and you have to be distinctive enough. And sometimes you lose a part because you know uh, you you're not going to be able to give it enough of a differentiation. Or they go, "Oh my God, you're a main character. You can't talk to yourself in this minor role unless you can make it sound really different." And yeah. many times I do, but sometimes they go, "You know what? Let's use so and so for that." And that's okay. That happens, um, and it's hap it, it's something that you run into a lot with uh, with character voice work when you're dealing with people who, who are multi voice like myself. So um, yeah, so and, and so I did bring that sensibility in when I was casting the voices for uh, that I will perform for the different characters, and and I wanted to be mindful that the audience when they're listening to it. Uh, it's very clear which character is speaking at each time. So, um, you know, I'm I I'm don't I can't separate things completely. You know, to be able to sound totally high and totally low. So it's going to be in my range. Um, but uh, there will be enough distinction and accent, dialect, delivery, attitude, all these types of things that will differentiate the characters. And some of them are very very different in their voices, and you probably you may not realize they would be the same actor. It would depend on the scene and the characters, but yeah. Um, and we made some distinct decisions too uh, about accents and dialects and things like that. We feel that in the fantasy genre, a lot of people just out of the way that films have been made kind of expect people to almost speak with a British accent most of the time in, in fantasy properties. Not always, but many times. Very, very and often. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's just something. New Zealand kind of, is becoming a common yeah. accent for all that too. So. <laughs> it is too. It is too. Just for for the reason that so many productions are done there, yeah. and uh, and same with Australia. And uh, so we're seeing more and more of that in some of the other Disney casting that they're doing down there too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so I wanted to. I, I thought to keep it distinct, I would do the narration in, in my standard voice, an American accent, and then we would the characters could speak in different accents and dialects, and and so that's how we worked it out. And uh, um, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's I, really I know. Funny. I know. As a screenwriter, because we yeah. it, when we write screenplays, uh, Mason, I don't know if you've written any screenplays, but um, when we write screenplays, we we refrain from inner dialogue. We refrain from a lot mm -hmm. of uh, scene description and, and motivation description. And so an actor's really left to just the dialogue itself to interpret a character. But 
as a novelization, you have the freedom to really give Mark through your writing a lot more detail on who a character is, what their motivations are, you know, the background of where they come from, what kind of region of the world they're at. Like you do a lot of the backstory stuff that a lot of actors spend a, a great deal of time learning to make up for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about creating a character and, and figuring out those kinds of backgrounds as a writer for yourself? Because obviously you've done a good job of it because Mark feels like everything was on the page and you didn't have a whole lot of notes for him, which means he actually got what you were trying to say so uh you mind just kind of explaining a little bit of your process and creating characters and and kind of the world building that you must be doing yeah it's it's it's, it's sort of a convoluted it's gonna be a convoluted answer um, well it's a so, convoluted world so. <laughs> yeah um the the main characters i uh i start off i'm a i'm a pantser uh by heart i just sit and start writing um, see where the story goes. And then at a certain point I pause and I go back and I start filling in, like caulking in the, in the, in the missing elements and start really building the character there. Once I mm -hmm. understand who I want the characters to be uh, in the initial, in the initial draft, uh, they kind of inform me who they're going to be in some respect. And then I go back and I fill in details that uh, backstory and things like that, that would explain why they are the way they are. Um, but a lot of the side characters too, they just show up on stage and they, they are who they are. And it's, it's funny to me that they just, it just comes some from this subconscious part of me. I, I, I call it letting the dog off the leash and just let the, <laughs> let them be who they are and they, how, and how they fit in the story just kind of works itself out. But as far as like how I uh, express that on the page is I'm, I'm really intentional about, uh, all of their dialogue should speak to who they are every line so every line that they speak should be a hint or a clue as to who they are so mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of subtlety but it's also over time builds up to give a framework of who that character is um so it's i don't try to shoehorn in a lot of detail that is like heavy-handed description of I, I let their behavior and their dialogue do that for me uh and it's just uh making sure that it it, it is just this subtle undercurrent of, of who they are and how they think and how, what they say that gives, uh, that gives clues as to what the character is and what drives them. Very cool. So now that we've explained all that, do you want to give us a little uh, synopsis of what the shadow mark is all about? Uh, sure. Uh, the shadow mark is about a former military commander that's on the run. Uh, he is accused of murder um, and so he's just a drifter going from town to town, just trying to survive and stay out of trouble, stay out and stay away from uh, uh, getting caught. Uh, when a couple of people share his fire with them, uh, with him, and uh, one is an older gentleman and another one is a younger one, and uh, they seem to be on the run too. And he learns a little bit about uh, why they're on the run. Um, and there is uh a turn of events that happen around their fire that lead to uh, Arik, the main character, deciding that nope, I'm gonna I'm gonna see that this guy's protected. He's being chased by assassins himself. Uh, they don't know why, but uh, he decides, well, I'm gonna protect him until we figure it out. And uh, they go on this adventure together, uh, trying to keep trying to both stay alive and uh, develop a uh, an unexpected bond between them as they as they go on their journey. It's a great arc too for both characters. Uh, both Arik and Kane have really transform and change by the end of the story. So it's a lot of fun um, in in watching that process as they start as totally odd bedfellows and and very different types of people, and kind of you start seeing them understanding and accepting things about each other and really coming to learn and depend on one another for things. So it's it's mm -hmm. really um it's a it's a great character arc and and speaking to what mason was talking about in terms of character before um with dialogue that was one of the things as an actor that was really great is that the dialogue that you do write does inform these characters very well i think it, it gave them very distinct personalities uh helped me choose where i wanted to place the voice what type of accent for instance uh the uh, the the uh, the two main characters arc is more of a soldiery sound, so he sounds a little deeper, a little gruff, a little bit more acerbic sometimes. 
Um, and I, I kept him with one accent. And then we really, the, the other character, Kane, is uh, more of a country boy. He's, he's a boy from the little, a small town and uh or a village really and hasn't really had much experience of the world he's very innocent he's an orphan and uh and so he's thrust into this big world and this major events happening and mystery and the stakes just keep going up and up and up and up throughout the story to to a very uh major climax that brings in things that are well beyond these characters and uh, worlds that they never thought they'd interact with in their own world um, there's redemption, there's mystery, there's, uh, there's romance, um, there's all sorts of, of great things along the way. Magic. Don't forget magic. Yeah, there's yeah, magic, yeah, too. magic. There's that, there's some magic. Intrigue. Uh, definite, intrigue. There's fighting. Uh, yeah. there's, there's intrigue on many levels. There's yeah. the, the mystery of what's going on with them. There's a, a whole sort of conspiracy possibly thing that mm -hmm. they discover um so there's a lot of a lot of things uh that that really hook you into the story um and and make it uh flow along very quickly it, it it's a very easy read and i think it's going to be a uh and it, and i mean as far as it draws you in and, and keeps you hooked and you want to read the whole thing you know it's like oh just another chapter oh just you know one of those types of books so um very kind words <laughs> it's but it's true i mean i really enjoyed the whole journey and uh it's it's so exciting to be able to to work on a project like this that you really love and that you're going to be able to now bring it to uh to a different audience and also do it's use the so same excited. material and speak to to people with those characters so it's exciting i i'm very excited to be part of this and uh, i can't wait for people to hear it me That's too <laughs> you know when I, when I, yeah go ahead oh, go ahead mason no, i was just go gonna ahead. say that like one of the things that when i was writing it is i i really wanted um to just keep pushing the two of them to the limit and they depend on each other so much by the end of the story uh, and they get to understand each other so much by the end of the story. But I wanted to just keep pushing them farther and farther, uh, both physically and mentally. And they just they both really take a beating uh, <laughs> by the end. Um, and I loved just taking them as far as they can go and find out what they would do. What how, how did they respond to those kinds of pressures and. Uh, that that's the part I loved about writing this book was just to see how far I could beat them up. <laughs> and, and he does. <laughs> and they and uh, he's not afraid to kill characters either. So there are some characters that are introduced and uh, they may not make it to the end of the book. So <laughs> well, that's uh, the way it should be, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's right for the story. It, it's yeah. all really good storytelling of why the why the things happen and, and uh, how one thing leads to another. So so um, it's a really interesting world. And, and as one of the, uh, are we doing it as a push goal? I can't remember. Or is it just another level of contribution with three tails, Mason? Oh, I, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a reward for. It's a reward. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, he also has written three other stories, short stories that take place in the same world that we're also recording. And it's not yes. doesn't have anything to do with the characters in the Shadow Mark directly, as far as we know. There's no tie-ins when you, you can listen to each of those stories standalone, and uh, and they're each quite different explorations into different aspects of the same world and universe that the Shadow Mark takes place in, and uh, that was a lot of fun too because each of those is is a really interesting and fun self-contained story that just it. It, it it brings this really wonderful moment to light and a new aspect of this uh, uh, mythology, cosmology world that he's got there um, and explores that. So that's a lot of fun, too. So we have we have that as well that we've done. So uh, there are well, three of those uh, again. So yeah. it's uh, I'm forgetting the name of the one, the something that the, the one with the chest, which, which the one the black chest. That? The black chest. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. And the Ode to Gamdosa, and the third one is Herb. Yes. So, because it's got... Oh, I think it's great that you're also H doing <laughs> those short stories as audio audiobooks. Um, you know, I myself, I love books. And I grew up reading. You know, my dad had a thing with me when my parents divorced that, like, every week he bought me a new novel to read. 
and mm. I had to read that whole novel by the time I came back around a week later to visit him again. And we talk about the book and he'd buy me another book. And we just kind of did that for years. Um, and I, I loved it. You know, it exposed me to so much fantasy and so much science fiction and mm. history and, and uh, period pieces and just expanded my whole worldview because all these different books that I got to read. Um, but as I've gotten older and my time has gotten, you know, more crunched and my eyes are, you know, doing the old man <laughs> eyes thing, you know, <laughs> reading is, you know, progressively harder and harder for me to do. But hey, I have a two hour commute going to and from work every day. So audiobooks kind of become my lifeline to to the written word. Um, so I, I, Mark, as soon as you were like, hey, you know, I'm doing this audio book and, you know, I'd love to bring the author on and, and talk about it. I was totally into it. Like, let's do it. Because <laughs> I think there's a Thank lot you. of people out there like <laughs> me who would love to read a book but for various reasons, it's it's just difficult to make that happen. And I think audio dramas, right. audiobooks, are so great um, for helping people stay tapped into the written word, which I think is incredibly important. I agree, um, and I think and it keeps, so many keeps writers about, writing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've had so many people ask me about when this is going to become an audiobook, and they, uh, and it's been this was literally years and years in coming, and I'm just could not be more excited to. Like you, like, like Mike said, like a whole new audience of people now mm -hmm. uh, can can experience it. And I'm just could not be more thrilled. I think what's amazing, too, is there are a lot of people who want the print book as well as the audio book. Mm -hmm. So there's there's people who like to experience the same thing that they enjoyed reading in another format. Um, but I, I think your story, David, is not unusual these days as people do have longer commutes or they might be going on a trip or, uh, you know, maybe it's just harder to read for some folks uh, and then it used to be just just reading wise so yeah um, I gotta wear these stupid glasses just to look at you guys yeah. on my computer monitor you know like it's... I have my own readers <laughs> yeah, well I'm, I'm kind of the opposite I, I'm nearsighted so I have eyes that are great for reading and seeing like we're doing now but you know anything far that's that's when the specs come out yeah you know, it's these guys so um, but yeah I totally get that so um, but that's another reason too why it's great that we have e-versions of books and and stuff too so that more people can read and in e-readers e and things like that so uh it's an it's a nice it's nice to have different formats that help different people uh to be able to experience books and audiobooks also help the the people who are uh uh, either non-sighted or have uh, have other vision uh, issues mm -hmm. with being able to yep. read print. Um, it gives them a whole other way to experience things too. So, um, and and some people just don't have the patience to read the same way. They they there we have audiences now who like to be entertained more. Just growing up with television and things like that. So, um, they're they're definitely an audience for audiobooks but i don't think they're the only one i think a lot of audiobook listeners are also readers mm -hmm. that's been at least my experience so i think it's just and it, and some people i know have re heard the audiobook and then they go out and buy the print book so and that's great you i know, do that for, anything. I think that's for, great too. <laughs> for, for books that really blow my mind on an audiobook i'll go out and buy the book just to make sure that the the book gets the credit as well you know like yes and um, then it has an honored place in your bookshelf too, as one exactly, of your exactly. Like you Absolutely. know, I, I heard this in an audiobook fashion, and I may not be able to ever read the book itself, but I want people to see it. Yep. <laughs> It'll be on my bookshelf in my living room or in my bedroom, and I want people to see it when they when they come visit, so that they know that's something they should be reading too. Um, right, because you can't really display an audiobook for the right. most most instances. I mean, the old <laughs> days you used to get little cases with the stuff in it. Now it's all you know, it's all streaming. You know, yeah. Sometimes I'll take providers. a screenshot and share that on social media and say, "This is what I'm listening to right now, and it's <laughs> awesome." You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Hey, um, you, you gave me a couple of samples of stuff. Do you want to play yeah, some? Yeah, I was going to say, this would probably be a good place to play a sample. So our first sample is from The Shadow Mark. So that's the uh, the main novel that, that we're voicing here. And uh, this takes place in, in sort of what Mason was talking about, how the, the two main characters kind of encounter each other with a, another character as well as there. 
and uh, it's they're meeting in the first chapter, so it's early on. We're not going to spoil any story for you, but it gives you an idea of the tone, the characters, and and stuff like that. Okay, so we've never done audio only playback on on the video podcast before, so this will be you know first for all of us, right? Um, yeah. So if we're just sitting here kind of dumbly <laughs> listening along. Uh, you know, that's what we all do when we listen to an audio book, right? <laughs> just right. Sit quiet and pay attention. So uh, here we go. Uh, this is the Shadow Mark uh, sample uh, with uh, Mark uh, doing the voices and Mason having written it. He wasn't sure why, but despite his own reservations, he found himself compelled to agree to Old Tan's offer. Less for himself and more for them. A vision of the two of them alone on the road was unsettling especially considering the highwaymen he'd encountered earlier. They would be easy targets. It is always better to travel with others when you can, Oryx said. I will join you tomorrow. He looked directly at Cain. As long as all are in agreement. Cain held Oryx's gaze for several moments, as if trying to gauge his character. You travel by oars, sir. We will slow you down. His voice had a deep resonance that surprised Arik. Arik shrugged. I've no appointments at the moment, and I walk more than I ride anyway. Kane's subtle lift of his eyebrows betrayed his skepticism about the truth of that. You seem decent folk, Arik added. I would appreciate the company, I think. You know nothing about us. Arik felt the corner of his mouth lift a fraction. I know enough. And we know nothing of you. But we know enough, Old Tan put in gently. Kane glanced at Old Tan, then made a barely perceptible shrug of one shoulder. Very well, he said, attempting an air of nonchalance. If will not be inconveniencing you. Not at all, said Arik. Old Tan's grin widened. Well then, there it is. What a happy meeting this turned out to be, yes? The fire was dying down. Flames hugged closer to the wood and burned redder and tamer. The fragile cathedral of spent wood collapsed in on itself with a crackle. Arik reached over and grabbed another pine log from his meager pile and tossed it onto the flames. Bright sparks leaped into the air, riding the eddies of smoke. Sleep, Arik told them. I'll keep watch for now. Old Tan's brow furrowed, and he looked as if he was on the verge of protest but Arik cut it off before he could voice it. I'm not tired, he said. Old Tan looked like he wanted to argue, but Arik could see the fatigue winning over. After a long pause, he nodded. Kane glanced over at his master a moment, then turned his eyes back to Arik. Wake me when you're ready. Boy will tend to the fire next. Arik replied with a nod. Old Tan wasted no time curling up on the ground in his cloak. Eyes closed, he fell into a steady rhythm of breathing almost immediately. Kane, on the other hand, spent time clearing away sticks and pebbles from his spot by the fire, smoothing the ground out with his hand. This was not someone accustomed to sleeping out under an open sky. He tried first to lie on his side, grunted, and moved on to his back. Arms folded over his chest, he closed his eyes. Arik leaned back, propping his torso up with his arms behind him, and stared into flames eating up the fresh wood. Then the ambush began. A little nice. cliffhanger at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the end, the whole end sequence from chapter one, so... Um. But I think it gives a good idea of the, who the characters are a little bit in their initial introductions and their reticence about each other initially, since uh, they are all kind of uh, on the run for different reasons and and brought together through circumstance and not quite sure whether they should either even trust each other. So, um, so I have I have to ask a technical question yeah, of you, Mark, sure. as a performer. So mm -hmm. when approaching the audiobook, do you read it straight through and bounce between characters as you go? Or are you piecing it together as various performances plus the narrator and putting it together in post? I'm still 
exploring what process works best for me because I'm new to this world. So of doing this and you normally we single track our characters in other properties. Um, but I've done both actually. I've done some of it has stuck from when I actually read it. I might give myself a slight pause just to make sure I come out of one voice and go into the other. But yeah, I mm -hmm. actually do read them uh, initially, especially uh, in the first take through all the way as the characters. Um, and then when you go back through playback, you might realize, oh, you know, I, sh it, you know, because of the, the, the weirdness of going between characters, Didn't maybe quite I'll do get far enough take. into that. Yeah, accent. That yeah or that wasn't quite the way I wanted to do that. So, or you come up with another idea. So I do, I do a little bit of both. Cause and you I know, I dabble together. a little bit in voice work and right. doing audio books is something I've always kind of wished I, I was doing or could do. Um, so I always, when I'm listening to them, I, I'm always wondering about various performers processes and, you know, so I thought, Oh, what a great chance. I'm going to get to ask Mark how he's approaching yeah, it. It's, it's, I'm comfortable doing it. I'm not sure all actors are. Um, mm -hmm. I think for any other actors, uh, narrators, readers, whatever you want to call us, um, who are doing this type of work, I think you have to find what process works best for you to give the best performance. I think yeah. that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, just doing it because it's convenient for editing is not not a great reason to do it, honestly. <laughs> um, it's You want to have the best product at the end of the day. So um, I, I do it because it gives me at least placeholders if I need to replace something too. But I do find I do give myself a little, you know, extra beat than might I might have normally if I were reading the story uh, live to someone. Um, even with character voices, I, I would probably flow a little bit faster in person. But in recording, I tend to give myself just a little bit more editing space in case I and then I can, you know, take that out or whatever. Yeah, uh, that in, makes sense. In post, yeah, it's I I just find that that's a process with how how it works best for me. I did end up doing redoing um, Kane because I came up with a better idea for my first voice for him and really settled into something. I wanted to use a West Country accent for him, and uh, in the in the first chapter you don't get too many things that way um, where his accent really comes through. There's not a, he doesn't has very short lines. But as it goes on, you'll hear more of that. And you, it, he gets into his natural rhythms, and, and uh, it really fits well as a counterpoint to, uh, to Arik's voice, I think, too. It makes them very distinct people. And, it, and the West Country accent is often associated, and not, not rightly so, but with farmers a lot uh, in the West Countries of, of England and stuff. So, and he is from a farming family and community. So uh, although he works as a tanner now, a tanner apprentice, and uh, and it it fit as sort of country boy comes to the city type of accent, which we were kind of yeah. going for. The, the well, even, was, even when you're dealing with American accents, you know, right or wrong. Yeah. That southern drawl is associated with farmers. Um, right. Right. And sometimes with and sometimes with people who are less intelligent, that's not the case at all. Yeah. You know? An yeah. accent doesn't necessarily imply intelligence. That was um, the yeah. trick for this, right? I mean, that's yeah. the one that you, did, you wanted to make sure that he had the country sound, uh, sounded didn't sound like a stupid. villager, yeah. but not make him sound like he was unintelligent. Right, yeah. right. And he's just inexperienced. He's naive about mm -hmm. certain things, but he's not stupid by any means. Um, he's right. very capable. He's he's thinking things through all the time, Some seeing different angles of things. He has very much a good heart, too. And I think there's something that also I loved being able to bring out because that accent to me, when you listen to it, it's very close. It's in fact, at times, it's almost the same as the American accent. Now, it's the one that's closest to ours uh, in England. And um, there's almost a heartfulness to a lot of his uh, his dialogue and his lines and when he speaks. And that accent has kind of that type of feel to me, too. Uh, which was really important to bring into that character. So I'm looking that's what struck it. me is that it had just like a warm empathy. It, yeah, behind it, he's he really was very empathetic and very understanding, and uh, just uh, very he's very much an empath in, in terms yes. of being able to read Arik. And outside of of the circumstances in now, he's very he's a very friendly person. He gets mm -hmm. along well with people. He's conversational. He's 
he 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 you know he meets other characters later in the in the book where they just you know he's having these long conversation conversations with them sometimes uh really to uh Arik's uh <laughs> frustration um so Arik is is very much the opposite though he's very closed mm -hmm. down he's shut down his heart he's shut down uh his ability to trust other people um and he's he's he comes off maybe as cold, but he's not necessarily cold. He's protected is what it really is. And he's also trying to protect others through through some of his own choices that he's made without giving away too much, I think. I don't know, Mason. Am I, am no, I staying, you're spot on. staying good? Okay, <laughs> no. right on. <laughs> See what I mean? It's spooky. It's like he yeah. reaches into my brain and just like pulls out these details that – he understands who they are. It's there in the text. I got to tell you, that's <laughs> the thing. I mean, it's what I tell actors all the time is sometimes you have um, you have to pull things that aren't on the page off when you're looking at scripts, you know, because we don't get all this backstory and uh, and mm -hmm. narrative and other and uh, description that you get. And it's very rich in a novel. However, um, especially in dialogue, dialogue uh, authors do a lot of work to make the characters speak in the way that they are and the, every word is well chosen for that character so it matters a lot uh, and i think and that that oftentimes is very much a difference between a, a reasonably good writer and a really excellent writer is the ability to write mm -hmm. dialogue that sounds unique to a character yeah uh, right so that not and all the characters sound the same it gets really hard too when you have characters that are only on the page for or you know for a short, uh, single chapter mm -hmm. or and to to have them sound distinct and unique really takes a lot of intentional work on the dialogue to make sure that they that their personality comes through in a much shorter amount of time mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. Um, and oh, I forget what I was going to say there, but no, you said <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful statement though, as far as that goes. Um, maybe we should listen to the other sample, which is from the short stories now. So this sure. is from the Ode to Gamdosa. This involves two, uh, the two main characters, as well as a, a third character, uh, Durek, who's the, the barkeep, who's kind of a feisty little guy. And then um, uh, Alfric, who is a bard, who has just finished performing a set uh, there, finishing up a conversation with the, the innkeeper where he's staying and all that stuff. And, um, and then a person who had been there the other night, Tanner, uh, who had heard the performance is coming and stayed later after this performance to talk specifically to Alfric. So, and this is kind of that, that part of that scene in the story. Okay, well, here it is. Durek lifted his hands in the air in a form of surrender. Well, no need to rush into any decisions at this time of the night, Master Bard. I'm certain you are weary from your performance. We can discuss this further in the morning. Indeed, Alfred made as if he was stifling a yawn with the back of his fist. I will sleep like the dead tonight. Durek slunk off back toward his bar, looking defeated and confused. Alfred looked back at Tanner and allowed his smile to open further. Well now, you've returned, but it appears too late for my performance. Tanner's eyes couldn't mask his surprise. You remember me? I do indeed. Two nights ago by the hearth. You were alone. Tanner scrunched his face. Embarrassed for a reason Alfred couldn't name, his cheeks turned pink. Your timing seems to imply you have a different purpose for being here, Alfred pressed on. How can I aid you, friend? Tanner avoided Alfred's direct gaze as if it made him uncomfortable. I hate to bother you about such a thing, but I didn't know what else to do. Oh my, sounds serious, Alfred said. He allowed the smile to drop and instead donned a sober expression. Uh, not terribly so, just annoying, really. One of your songs, the jaunty one about the adventures of Gam Dosa? Ah, yes, one of my favorites. Well, it's giving me the most frustrating earworm. Alfred lifted his brow. Oh. 
Uh, <laughs> look just up those right there. Earworms. <laughs> yes, and with the fantasy world, and you can imagine it might have some different connotations. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. But, uh, so, yeah, this is a, uh, it's a cute tale. Uh, it's uh, definitely, uh, definitely very different tone from the other story. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, no combat in this one. <laughs> 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 that's another thing that's great, too, I have to say, with, uh, with the Shadow Mark. There are some great fight scenes in it and uh and uh really really descriptive they they're they don't go on forever they're they're tight they're they're action oriented and and uh that's a lot of fun reading that because in those moments it's really my narration that has to has to explain everything because people aren't right. having conversations in the middle of the fight usually maybe a, right. a word or You're two getting, here or there i'm gonna thrust you here and i'm gonna yeah. block you there <laughs> exactly. you get any of that right? <laughs> you get none of that type of stuff so um so you really have to sell it with pacing with energy with uh, a change up so it's not going to be just you know you know, very standard narration pace the pacing is going to have to adjust to the fight and uh, you have to feel the excitement of that moment and since you know the uh, it's this theater of the mind when we're doing audio um, I really have to draw you in with kind of like how a, a mime uses their body to teach you a whole story and, and to display that I have to do that with my voice so pacing energy um, you know, sometimes very staccato, sometimes very, you know, and then pauses in the right times too. And sometimes right. the dramatic effect of what happens. So, um, I hope it's, uh, I, I hope I'm, I'm making it as clear as I think I am. So, <laughs> but well, the <laughs> time sure will tell are. as long as, as long as Mason is happy, that makes me happy. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that should be your I starting would... point for all of it, right? So Absolutely. If happy, and then you're, in, you're in good shape. Yeah, and he's been very happy so far, and so that's, that's always my job is to make the uh, – and it's a team effort, too, so mm -hmm. it's a creative thing. And I'm not – if if he sees an issue with something and lets me know, I'll adjust that, you know. So that's okay. that's part of part of the process is coming together because it makes it, it – it's a team effort, and it makes it even a better product at that point. So um, it's it's been so much fun, I have to tell you. Um, editing is not so much fun. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my end either. <laughs> I'm in I'm the not middle of audio editing on a feature film right now. Oh, so I yeah. I totally feel you, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, and it's different too. in uh, as a, as a voice actor coming into the world of, of audio books, um, that I've done some types of things like this before, but I had an engineer. I had somebody, an editor mm -hmm. that would do all that other work for me. In this world, it's it's you. Mm -hmm. You gotta learn. So yeah, I have to learn some other things and techniques to be able to, uh, and, and uh, thankfully uh, services like ACX have come along, which make it kind of gave you a standard of what, how you should adhere to things. and and uh and get the, Loudness type, levels get the right types of levels yeah yep. exactly yep. so you learn a lot of technical stuff it's it's been a bit of a learning curve I'll, I'll admit for this first book but um i bring decades of other experience to the table that make up for that so um right. but it's well, been i think fun. that's part of why we become creatives right because we like yeah. to learn new things and i think that's part of the deal right we just continually learn and train and and teach ourselves to do all sorts of new things um i and think it's, it's just kind of in the creative's blood it is it's a one it's it's basically a one-man show you know which that's every actor would love to do something like that someday right. you know so it's like a it's for me it's a, it's a dream in a lot of ways and plus i love fantasy as a genre um, I love science fiction as a genre. So all these types of properties, uh, this is uh, and it's, this is stuff I grew up with. So being able to be part of these worlds, because I get involved in projects that are so far removed from these types of things and so mundane <laughs> that um, that it's really nice to have something that takes you to a place that's uh, an escape, but uh, but entertaining at the same time. So. Right. Um, so I'm, I've been, I've been loving the whole process of, of going through that, discovering the characters, 
um, you know, and then now really putting it all together and bringing it together in the actual files that we're going to upload. <laughs> <laughs> Mason, I'd be, uh, I'd be, you know, totally not doing my, my job if I didn't ask you a little bit about your own background and how you came to, to be an author. Um, um did you always yeah, know so, that you would be one or is um, it something I've always discovered? wanted to be one, even, even as a kid. Um, uh, really it's, it's, it's a funny story that I, when I was 13 and I was writing my own little short stories and I wanted to make a science fiction magazine for, uh, my, uh, school and I didn't want it to be just all my own short stories. So I had this idea that I would, uh, write to Isaac Asimov and ask if I could use one of his part of his stories. Uh, so I wrote him a letter and Sure enough, he sent me back a reply on a postcard, and I still have it today. It's signed with his name on it. He typed it out on a postcard that I wasn't allowed to use uh, any of his short stories because he didn't actually own them. Uh, so, and I just was so impressed with the idea that uh, he would do that. Um, and I, from that moment on, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be that. I wanted to be that author. Uh, uh, and I kept and I kept writing from that age on. And I did take a hiatus for a while, like after college and I went, you know, picked a career and blah, blah, blah. And then I started writing. Um, and I did this, uh, sprawling epic, like this game of Thrones style, uh, multi-character, like, yeah, 200,000 word nonsense. And, uh, it was absolutely <laughs> awful. It was just, it was really terrible. It was contrived. It was, it was, it was, yeah, it was awful. Um, but I did finish it and it, and, uh, it, it taught me that I could write a novel. <laughs> I could do it. I knew it, I, that it's actually something I could do from beginning to end. And then I got advice from somebody that was, uh, cause I was trying to make it for, fit and there was all these square pegs and round holes that just, I couldn't, it was just too convoluted. Uh, so somebody said, put it on a shelf, forget about it, sit down and write your next one. And so that's what I did. I, uh, uh, then I wrote my next book, which was Lord Mouse, and that's the one that got picked up. Uh, so, uh, and that's really started my journey uh, of of writing novels. And now I've, I've written a total of seven so far. This I have a fourth one coming out this coming year, um, and then another one that's finished that I'm going to be working on too. So, yeah, it's been it's been a fun journey. I I, I dig it. That's awesome. What's your What's your uh, r routine for writing? Do you do you like set aside uh, a specific, specific period of time in the day and and usually write no matter home, what? <laughs> yeah, I come home from work and I and I start. I um, usually in the evening. I'm a I'm a night owl by nature, and uh, my best creative window is between ten and midnight. Uh, mm -hmm. So I hear you. <laughs> when, when the house that's is quiet. My, that's my else. thing too. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Or well, actually, I'd say ten to two, but <laughs> yeah, I would too. But now that I've got a nine to five job, job work, I'm my creative hard. work, my creative work suffering because I can't stay up so late. I know it's hard, isn't it? I'm wasting all my best creative hours sleeping. <laughs> right? It's ridiculous. Uh, for the day job, I have to get up too early to stay up till two. But that's that. That is my. That is definitely my prime time. Of uh, my brain turns on. So uh, I try to write every day. I try to get it uh, just words on a paper. Get out of my own way and just and just write. Uh, like I said, I tend to be a pantser and just like see where my story goes. Um, I like to think that if I'm surprised, my readers will be too. Um, so I just I uh, I do go back and in, in editing process and fill in all the gaps that need to be filled in and make it a cohesive story and uh, uh, I I also like uh, a quote by Isaac Asimov above all else be clear mm -hmm. uh, so part of my process is just making sure that my story is clear and uh, not uh, not too descriptive but also not too bare so it's a, it's an interesting balance yeah. One other question. Are you a pen and paper kind of guy or are you a uh, sit down at the keyboard and type? I'm a, I'm a keyboarder. Yeah. Uh, I, I hate my penmanship. So uh, I get too <laughs> I frustrated. love my penmanship. I just don't have the patience to do it. <laughs> Same. I, uh, it's it's my ADD. Yeah. <laughs> I, I start writing. I, ah, just toss it out. I can't do it. So I can, I can sit at a keyboard and type for hours, but like having to write things on paper, I can't do it. I don't think my hand could even do that anymore deal with the stress of that i think it'd tire out really fast these right? days yeah. you know i'm yeah. so used to typing everything i can i a lot of respect for the people who still do that type of work that's, mm -hmm. that's not me 
Now, interestingly mm. enough, I've picked up an iPad Pro and I've got the Apple Pencil and I've started writing my notes that way. And I don't fatigue writing oh, digitally really? the way I oh, fatigue writing nice. with ink. Oh, because you don't have to put so much pressure. Oh, yeah. sure. Right? Sure. You just kind of and flow. that's my problem. I do. And I'm actually finding pressure. myself writing a lot more now that my iPad allows me to do that without straining. Um, cool. And does it convert it into text afterward? Then can you like take you your can, you, Depending on what app you're using and whatnot, you can set it to either just accept it as your handwriting or, yeah, it'll interpret it oh, and cool. then turn it into written text that you can copy and paste into other stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like enjoying getting back into writing again, like with mm. my hand. You know? <laughs> but it's digital. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Kind of interesting. I, you that, know, it's bringing me ahead. back to the old school, but making it less painful. <laughs> yeah. There was one thing I was thinking about that, that I'll also have another reason why I love being involved in this property that I wanted to say before I go, and that's being a gay man, being able to uh, approach a subject that where I, I'm, I really understand that world and the people in it. Now I'm not saying this is a gay novel because it really, it, it's, there are a couple characters in there who are gay and that's great. And that's it, but it's not the core focus of everything. It's part of the arc. It's part of important stuff in the, in the story, but it's not, I, I don't want to say that it's like, um, not important because it is, it, 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 but it's, it fits within the story and it works really well. And it's nice to be able to be a gay man and give voice to gay characters too. So that was always my intention. And too, when I was writing it was to, uh, because I've read a number of stories that were gay stories that had just a fantasy backdrop um, that yeah. had nothing to do with the story. Uh, I wanted them to populate that world and be a part mm -hmm. of that world and, uh, and, and be positive, strong characters, strong gay characters in, in that world, uh, in a world that accepts them for the most part, for yes. who they are. And uh, that, that's always was, was really important to me to have that as, uh, as, as, these characters that exist in this world and they're a part of it and all it's all together. It's not, it's not a gay novel. It's not a fantasy novel per se. It's, it's, it's all interwoven. That's beautiful. And, and, you know, I think that's the way it should be, right? Like they should just right. be yes. characters. And in the end, you know, it doesn't affect how they fight or anything. Right. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. No. Yeah. You know, it's just you know, I would not want to, you know? I would not want to have to go up against Arik. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Nobody, I don't think anybody would. Uh, no. and it's, it's for me too. It's, uh, I didn't want it to be a story like a coming out story or, uh, a, um, a story of, uh, adversity for being gay because that's all been done. Um, I wanted it. I wanted them to live their lives as, as gay men and be strong and be positive, uh, examples of, of gay characters in a book. Well, and I think in the end, uh, too, the best way to kind of encourage acceptance is to just show acceptance, right? Not, not adversity necessarily, right? right. Like if we can just envision a world where that acceptance is normal, then right. that becomes normal, <laughs> right? And should be normal, right? And and when I and that's what this is the this is the novel that I wanted to read as a kid, where I could read a character, a gay character that is living his life and being true to his life and uh and living in this fantasy world it was it's, it's the novel i wanted to read uh that's fantastic that's why that's why i sat down and wrote it and it, it, it spoke that way to me I'll, I'll have to say that that very much if i were when i was younger i would love to have read a, a story like this it would have been very affirming for me mm -hmm. um I will also say that we hope to make you cry at certain points in this book. I know I did when I read the the book itself, so I'm hoping probably the keep... same parts where I cried when I wrote it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So there's there's some very moving moments in the story that I think are going to really get the uh, the listener uh, moved, and uh, I'm looking forward to to being able to do that. It's uh, there's there's a lot of great story here. Awesome. And so you guys are going to be. Or did you launch a Kickstarter already? Or are you about to launch a Kickstarter? About to October 1st, October 1st. Okay. 
That's the day the that the podcast is going to drop. Oh, so perfect how about that? timing. There we go. <laughs> the samples, yeah. the samples you hear here are the same samples that we'll have there. We may have some other stuff down the road too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as Kickstarters, you adjust as as the the thing is going through. Well, um, you guys but, give me the link to yeah. your Kickstarter. I'll make sure it's in the show really? notes, uh, both here and on the on the audio podcast. And uh, you know, I I strongly encourage uh, anybody who likes audiobooks to to check this out and and support the kickstarter i know i will um we're and, so excited uh, thank you. Forward, look forward to hearing all the all the completed uh project and yeah. i think the the contribution levels are very reasonable that i think a lot of people will find it quite quite easy to contribute and really i think mm-hmm. not only that you're going to get some really great value and you're really going to enjoy what you get so we're very excited to bring this to you fantastic well, Mark and Mason, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, my I'm gonna, pleasure. I'm going to go and uh, sign off and go rest. I, I got my uh, <laughs> flu vaccine and my COVID vaccine yesterday. And Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. You got Woo! about a day and a half if it's yeah. anything yeah, like I'm at mine. The tail Although end mine was... Of, uh, <laughs> tail end of feeling better, I guess. <laughs> mine was just the COVID. I, I didn't want to combine the flu this time. Oh, because, yeah. And I did have a, about a day and a half reaction just to covid but tomorrow yeah, morning so i got a friday I'm afternoon so i'm i'm just starting to feel a little bit normal but being up for an hour with you guys has worn me out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of people well, feel thank, that way <laughs> thanks for having us david <laughs> no, thank you guys so much for coming on i really appreciate you sharing the story with me and, and sharing the background on on everything and uh, i really really wish you guys all the success with the audio Thank book you so much. And, and Mason with your future novels. Uh, hopefully we can have you back to talk about your next book when it's ready. I would love that. Awesome. Yeah. Just let me know. Excellent. All right, guys. Thank you, Later. David. We really yeah. appreciate it. Take so, care, everybody. Thank you so much. It's been great. Bye. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that claps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears.